because of the wide variation in airside system configurations and components, we made this video to give an overview and provide some classification schemes of those types of systems so that we can quickly have a way to identify them in the field and understand their implications on performance. So the first classification scheme we could talk about is airside methodology, or what's the overall approach being used. Once we understand the approach, we can look at the specific unit types of air handlers to meet that approach. Then we can look at the add-on features that have been installed and try to understand more about the distribution about how air gets from an air handler to the zone and back. So what do we mean by airside methodology? Well, that's a general understanding of what the system is supposed to do and how it's doing it. So as an example, we could look at whether or not an airside system has segregated ventilation or whether it's more of a conventional system that provides minimum ventilation as well as addresses the loads for a space. So these units look very similar, but on the left, we have a unit that's part of a dedicated outside air system or a DOAS. And this is where we have 100% outside air being brought in at low volume, possibly tempered with a coil or with something like a heat or enthalpy wheel and that's being brought to the zone specifically for ventilation. So with an air handler system, we'd have the HVAC loads being picked up by that unit to where in the DOAS, there's a completely separate HVAC system at or near the zones designed to handle those loads. Once the overall HVAC strategy has been determined, another way that we could look at these units is the scale. So how big are they? And we can talk in terms of CFM. So you can look at something like rated CFM on nameplate data or in as-builts, or there's some kind of field rules of thumb that you can use. So assuming that a designer didn't want more than 500 feet per minute through the inlet of an airside system, you can look at something with known dimensions like a filter rack and determine what that CFM most likely is. There's also a number of phrases that you may hear in the field that might be condensed with information about what that system is designed to do. So when you hear things like this X amount of CFM air handling unit is meant to handle a, these series of set points to serve these zones, that can contain a lot of information about what that design intent is. And we may pay attention to the control infrastructure meant to address that control objective. So we have in older systems, something like pneumatic control, where you actually have compressed air being ran through tubing around the buildings to use that as a modulating signal to things like control valves and dampers with something like these receiver controllers that you see here. With electric control, we're replacing that pneumatic signal with an electric one, either something like 0 to 10 volt or 4 to 20 milliamp, and that's for input-output going to and from that control equipment. With electronic control, also known as DDC or direct digital control, we still have that electric input-output, but we also have microprocessor-based controllers that can achieve more advanced sequences of operations and will communicate with other controllers and possibly to a front end for enhanced automation. So understanding what the control infrastructure is running these airside systems will heavily determine what capabilities we have to modify the system and how sustainable from an O&M perspective those changes will be. So another way we can look at classifying these systems is by the air handler unit type selected. So one quick way that we can talk about airside systems is whether we have a package unit that was say selected out of a catalog with specific features in place or more of a built up system where individual components like a fan is selected and that's important once we look at retrofitting these units and understanding how easy it may be to put new capabilities into these types of systems. We can also look at where this equipment is and that may change the terminology that we use. So for something like a rooftop unit, that's really just an air handling unit installed on a roof. When you have a simple box and a coil in or near a zone with a simple blower motor inside, that would be a fan coil unit or FCU. And we have some specialized units like this PTAC that are used often in hotel or dorm situations where you have electric heating and cooling and through the wall ventilation typically. 
The location of specific key pieces of equipment and components for that air handler may also change the terminology. So when we take the zone dampers away from the zone and put them right at the discharge of an air handling unit, and you have something like a hot and a cold deck, maybe a bypass deck, so multiple air streams that go right to those discharge dampers that modulate to mix that air and send it to the zone, that would be called a multi-zone unit. We can look at the fan itself and how that can be something like the centrifugal device that we've looked at on the left or more of an axial device, which is a direct drive fan or a prop fan. And those are going to have different implications about operation and ease of retrofit. We can also note with things like a centrifugal fan, when you put two of those together, we may call that a double width, double inlet fan. And that can have implications for how stratified air, depending on the directionality of that stratification, may exist past the discharge of that fan. So some implications on performance. And like we looked at with the pump curves, we have fan curves that are specific to the geometry and the blade cross-sectional area and direction for these fan wheels. And that's going to determine or limit the pressure and flow combinations that we have available. We can look at the belts driving those indirect drive systems for centrifugal fans. And the type of belt used is going to put a different efficiency factor into that overall system. You can have standard V-belts, you can have a cog belt, which has those notches on the bottom to reduce bending resistance, or we may have synchronous drive belts, which are going to be the most efficient. There's specific add-on features that are going to be common to a lot of these systems that we're going to want to understand as well. So the most common and the gift that keeps on giving in retro commissioning applications is the economizers. So the economizer is really these series of dampers and temperature sensors that modulate how much return air is mixing with how much outside air to be sent as mixed air through the supply side of the air handler. So we have a separate video to talk about all of the things that can go wrong with these and the different performance considerations when you're looking at these systems. But it's, it's enough to say that if you have an airside system with an economizer in your building, and depending on your climate and the fan operation and the number of hours ran, that that is almost by default of high interest in a retro commissioning application. So the way that the return air comes back to the unit may geometrically be different with different types of air handling units. But that may not be very important. What's, what's more critical is what type of fan configuration you have inside that air handling unit. So one of these is a return fan, and one of them we would call a relief fan. Can you tell which one? Well, on the left we have a return fan, and the way that we operate that return fan and the design intent is different. That return fan will run with the supply fan, and its job is to constantly be overcoming the duct static losses on the return side to bring air back to the unit. Now, we could have upsized the supply fan in order to accomplish that, but with medium or larger systems, the more you upsize that supply fan, the more you're pressurizing your space in order to have enough, have enough inches of water column to get that air back. So to avoid that overpressurization, the return fan is installed. The relief fan deals with that overpressurization differently. So it's on the other side of the recirculation duct, and it may run intermittently with a cooling mode or off a space pressure sensor that may tell the relief fan when to operate. The coil arrangement inside the air handling unit and within the greater airside system is important as well. So here we have a very specific combination of coils. We have a face and bypass preheat coil that can have air either brought across the preheat coil or bypassed, depending on the damper position, a cooling coil, and then the reheat coil that's shown here in the zones. Additional damper configurations are possible even on the economizer side, where instead of just a return air, exhaust air, and outside air damper, there may be a separate minimum outside air damper that could be a binary open and close and, and is meant to handle the ventilation air separately from the free cooling air that the outside air damper would facilitate. 
The filters can also be important, so we may want to look at the combinations of those involved. So the filters, protect equipment, pre-filters, protect final filters, which may have a higher MERV rating, which are intended to capture smaller particles that we could have going through our zones. And that can have important, important implications on the performance and the extra fan energy needed for those pressure drops, as well as how often those filters need to be changed. So is the system constant volume or is it variable volume? Well, there's going to be some equipment or configuration that's going to accomplish that variable volume. And typically what we're going to see is variable frequency drives with these VFDs on the fan motors intercepting that power signal and sending out a modulating signal to maintain something like duct static pressure. You can also have older technology like inlet guide vanes that will mo that modulate the pitch on those blades to accomplish a different pressure drop and affect the flow in that way. So this is an older technology and many times we'd retrofit this with VFDs but there's a specific way to retrofit it, there's a specific blade pitch that would be ideal to lock it at and the way that it's locked sometimes can be done poorly so you may want to be on the lookout for that. Distribution, so what happens when it leaves the air handler? How does it get to the zones and how does it get back? Well, we would want to know is this serving a single zone or is this serving multiple zones? That has implications on what type of sequence changes that we can make. Single zones lend themselves to more demand control ventilation, but multiple zones as well, especially where you have dissimilar spaces that may have different schedules or varying flow or temperature set point needs may have opportunities for optimization as well. Where the zones are and what type of zones they are is another way to classify. So again, with these types of phrases, you may hear things like this unit serves these spaces on this floor for these hours in this way. So pay attention to the type of zones and what their needs are. Whether or not we have a single duct or a dual duct configuration is important as well. So all airside systems may have this propensity for simultaneous heating and cooling, but it's a little more baked into the design with dual duct. And even though we can get a lot tighter temperature control in a dual duct system, we may want to look at how we reset discharge air from those decks and how we're operating those zone dampers, whether they're operating together or they're operating independently may determine how much performance improvement we can have in a system like that. The air terminal units or the zone equipment will be different and that can be important. So for the single inlet VAV box on the left, we see because of this X-shaped flow ring and the red and blue pressure pickups coming off it that it's a pressure independent box, meaning that flow can essentially be monitored in a way that regardless of the upstream pressure, we're able to maintain our airflow through this unit. We also see that there's a shaft sticking through this controller and that has an actuator built into the controller that can control the damper. There may be something like reheat or reheat coil at the discharge of this box. Those are some pretty typical configurations that we'll have. We may even have different combinations of fans either in series or in parallel that are pulling air from the zone directly without sending it back to a central air handling unit for local reheat purposes. And the way that that air is brought back, there's really two flavors here. We can have a ducted return, which is less subject to losses as it makes its way back to the air handling unit. Or we can have a plenum return, which may have fittings or boots that come up from the return grills in the space, but are going to be more susceptible to, to sound transmission and thermal losses in that plenum, depending on how that envelope or how that plenum space is insulated. So feel free to try to think in these terms about how we can classify different parts of our airside system. There's a lot of combinations, there's plenty that we didn't cover, but these are some of the main categorization types that we wanted to cover so that we can move on and look at more performance issues, which we'll do in the next video.